And you guys can feel free to work together and talk about anything here. We are, this, is, this is open mic now, so. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you think this approach of this like bottom-up traversal of trees it yes. could be useful outside of APL as well, or do you think it's something that's suited? Definitely useful outside here. Yeah. So I wasn't going to go full, full, full uh, philosophy just yet. Uh, I recommend that everybody watch my design patterns versus anti patterns in APL talk at Functional Conf 2017. Um, so I've actually used it um, for doing concurrent updates to a tree. Yeah. That actually works much better if you start the lead and you work all the way up, and then the conflicts yeah. get reduced when you get here. Yeah. So this can work. The problem is it's a, it's a human factor scalability question, right? So these techniques will work in other languages just fine, right? Um, there's a question of is your language, does your language have the right notation for making this your bread and butter way of doing things? And I think this is a really critical question because the way people want to approach this is they want to keep their old stuff. They want to keep the old way they're doing stuff, the, their mental models and the stuff. And if you try to do that, you will never be able to maximize the value that you get from a style like this. Because the fact that the notation allows me to express this and explore this dynamically so succinctly means that I can actually use this as my primary way of thinking about trees. If you have to think about trees the other way first and then do the conversion over or you write your prototypes in the other way and then convert over, it's never going to be scalable and it's never going to be practical. You're never going to be able to write, you know, 30 compiler passes and make it really feel nice. And so you want to, even in other languages, if you're going to do it, you really have to optimize that usability and understand how to interact with these kind of source uh, these kind of concepts in a usable way because people are very bad about designing HCI around these concepts. Um, the HPC community is the main one that does it and they're horrible at it. What about Scheme? Love Scheme. <laughs> oh, I adore Scheme. I was a schemer for 10 years before I did APL. So, with that part of Scheme, we don't see my What I say is the reason I'm in APL now is because APL was the only language that I was not able to re-implement and get all of the benefits in Scheme. So I, I done tons of scheme and every single time, C++, Haskell, ML, all that, I can have it all in scheme. I can re-implement all the goodies, all the important salient benefits that you get from the other languages. I can get that in scheme, no problem. Language of least restriction is beautiful, it's lovely, I love syntactic abstraction, it lets me be a god. But I'm a puny god when it comes to APL and getting it into scheme because APL is not the, the benefits here are not just the semantics that we're using and not just the algorithms. It's the usability and the interaction paradigm and the experience design around working with those. And that's actually the main benefit. This is a really critical benefit and it's one that I can't get into the other languages. Because the notation allows me to explore this data at the speed at which I can explore data in my brain. And it allows me to visualize and interact with the data on a, on, in a way that is very difficult or impossible to mimic with other notations simply because I'm typing too much. And then the fact that I can fit so much into a space and see patterns is part of that aspect because now my brain can see connections across compiler passes, across modules, across function uses, and those patterns allow me to write better architected code that's more reliable, that doesn't have the same bugs because I've thought about big problems. So the hard bugs disappear and all that's left is the small bugs that are easily caught in testing. Um, because I can think very deeply about the questions and then I can see how it's all going to fit together. And I've, I've talked about this at length in my other, other talk. So um, I'm, well, I'm happy to go, go into it in more detail, but I, I really go into detail for an hour with citations in the other talk and we can, you know, I don't know if there's like an unconference thing or something like that. You guys could watch the talk, come back and roast me <laughs> and say, what, you're crazy, man. But in essence, the benefit of APL is, is gained when you take, um, I have eight of them, eight design patterns that you're taught as good practices, best practices. This is the way to do it. Everybody follows them implicitly or is taught to follow them. To really leverage the power that you see here that allowed me to think about this stuff, you do the diametric opposite of those best practices in every single eight cat one of those categories. And that's where you really start to shine. 
And it's very hard to do that when your language is designed around those other principles. Um, it's not impossible. You, you're still going to be able to get benefits going to the other languages, but people have tried for years to do this in other languages, and it's just not as easy, and it just doesn't scale on the human factors side as well. Um, you can get it to perform well, but, but you won't be able to maintain it very easily. And that's a, that's a real problem when you're doing parallel computation. You have to maximize for ease of thinking about parallel problems, not just, uh, and in fact, I would put that higher than ease of proving the correctness of your code, which is going to ruffle some feathers. But I think it's fundamentally more important, especially in parallelism, to have ease of reasoning at a human level and seeing and thinking about your code organically as a human than to be able to guarantee machine checking on that code. Are the two ultimately the same? Depends. <laughs> so actually, a fun little aside, right? Uh, part of the reasonability of this is one of the questions that often occurs is how, um, what is the performance of my parallel code? This is a big question. Well, if you write the code in the style that I've given, uh, oh, I didn't do it for that one. Uh, here we go. Here's a, here's a relatively complex pass. Here, uh, let's do the whole complexity analysis. Here we go. Here is an analysis of the computational complexity of one of these pieces of code. And notice how short it is. Because the way the code is written allows me to trivially identify critical paths, computational complexity, etc from the structure of the code easily, then group it all together around large iterations and get to my final result. And I argue that this constitutes a sufficient proof of the computational complexity for this language and this notation. And it is, in fact, so easy that um, a future compiler update will likely give you this information for free as a side effect of your com running compiling the code. It will just tell you what comp uh, computational complexity class you're in. How do you read this notation? So the, <laughs> so the way to read it is you start at the top and you see it's, it's selecting across a given expression and then it's saying what that complexity is. And then it's grouping them together into bigger and bigger complexities so you can see sort of the logic tree. So if you're familiar with the, the logical inference rules using vertical bars, it's very similar in the overall structure. So sort of that implies that, implies that, implies this, implies this. I just multi-dimensional, so I'll go this direction and then this direction as well. I must say, you are the most prolific user of Notepad I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's intentional. I've got to talk on that. <laughs> if you look at the uh, architecture description of the Codefence compiler on YouTube, I go into detail about why I, I do it this way. Yes? I'm not understanding the form of complexity. So this is, um, which complexity am I analyzing here? This is the computational complexity. So in other words, the raw computational complexity of a uh, omega filter over the 10 equals t of n sub omega, that's the count of omega. That's like n. So it's a linear complexity. And so then this is also a linear complexity. So then when you take those to an iteration over, this is the style of that iteration I was speaking about, reducing the index set. So I explicitly reduce the index set until it's equal to 0. And so if I take this iteration in, into full account, it's d times the count. And d is the uh, length of the longest chain of var var references for this particular case, where I'm, I'm doing a static single assignment resolution. So I'm inlining variables to chase the chain up. And so the complexity of that is based on how far up the chain I have to chase to resolve it. So wait, when you parallelize here, are you parallelizing based on omega, or are you parallelizing based on d, or am I really all? Ah, so f to understand that, you need to look at the critical path complexity. So if you look at the critical path complexity of that same thing right up there, that's actually logarithmic in computational or critical path complexity for parallelism. And then the other one is constant. So it's a one critical path. 
And so all together, it's d times the uh, log of n. What, what's the glyph that you're using here? Um, the cir uh, star circle, yeah. that's logarithm. Okay. Yeah. So power is star, logarithm is the circle star. Exactly. But there are no branches, or very few branches. There are no branches. There are essentially no loops. There's no recursion. There's no if statements. There's no pattern matching. There's nothing. I see. Okay. I'm using okay, function composition. <laughs> and with just function composition, complexity analysis is tractable. That's cool. I see. This is now and you can begin to see why I favor this approach. Because it's not just one thing that makes it usable, right? It's the sum of the whole experience that allows me to actually think about this stuff productively. It's not just one thing. It's the holistic application of all these principles in a, in a way that support one another. So this helps me to see my code. Like when I'm working on a CUDA kernel, you know, I can't reason easily on a CUDA kernel about how my thing is going to go. I, in fact, that's my, you know, people spend whole, papers on just figuring out how that computational complexity is going to work. Um, but I needed, I, because I'm working at scale, I've got, I'm writing a whole program, not just a tiny little piece of an algorithm. I can't do that. I can't afford to spend, you know, six months analyzing the complexity of something that is equivalent to three lines of APL, or three characters of APL code. <laughs> So instead, I need, uh, this allows me to scale up the amount of brain power I can apply to the problem. And so then I can reason about complexity at scale, right? I, I've done like, you know, big complexity, and it takes about five minutes to do it, or less. Right. And you can reason about it on the fly. This is just the diagram to help people understand it. I don't actually ever write these down for myself, because you can keep this in your head trivially. Basically, saying each chunk, you're basically analyzing the runtime complexity, and then yes. And then where did the parallelism come into play on this? Sorry. So uh, each of these instructions is parallel by, uh, by by default. There is no sequential stuff here. Everything is parallel. Oh, so you can do that chunk, that chunk, and that chunk. And yeah. So there's chains of data flow. So this is a data flow oriented program. So there are data dependencies which limit your parallelism. But otherwise, there's no implicit requirement for parallelism or for sequentialism anywhere here except the data dependencies. Is the data dependencies basically so like basically the chunks following each other? I guess. Um, I read this left yes. Right? Yes. So if you read it from right to left, that's the primary way the data flows. Okay. Yes. Right to left. Yeah, from right to left, the data flows primarily that way. Um, but for instance, this thing here, that's a scalar expression. And so scalar expressions basically represent a single GPU kernel, and they all happen all at once. Okay. And so this is a single thing. There's no data dependency from here to here, right? Uh, now, now, from here to here, there's a little data de dependency, right, to get the TC into that, but. So you can basically parallelize that first line to a degree, and then I yeah. is based, or the, the second computation dependent on, is the second computation dependent on the first? I'm assuming yes. Because am I supposed to read this down as, a, as well? Um, yes, this is, there's, a, there's generally a data dependency from each line to each line, but how that data dependency work can often be fine-grained. So if you're familiar with trapezoidal decomposition of parallel dependency chains in, say, like uh, stencil computations. Okay, look that up. <laughs> uh, say that again? Uh, trapezoidal uh, slicing or trapezoidal decomposition of stencil computations. This is a way of parallelizing across fixed steps. So you can do that with, with some of this kind of code. I don't do it explicitly because I think it'd be more fun to see if the compiler can do it eventually. And I don't need it right now uh, because I'm trying to solve other problems. <laughs> So one thing at a time. But in, in theory, there's nothing stopping a compiler from doing data dependency analysis and range analysis on the uh, access patterns and then saying, we're going to decompose it according to this model. So code defund basically analyzes this, and the compiler basically figures out how much parallelism to give your application. No. 
This is important. This is a critical thing. This is power to the user, not power to the compiler. I'm of the Kent Dibvig School of Compiler Design. That means you want your compilers to be predictable, not prescient. Right? So what I do instead is I make the compiler predictable in how it's going to behave so that you can predict exactly how your parallelism is going to work. Right, but so what identifies? So, so the compiler does very, very little. But how do you determine what it's, is there some APL command that parallelizes? Or? No, this is all just, it's, it's parallel by construction. It's all implicitly parallel. So for instance, um, plus is parallel, right? Oh. So, so if I take five plus iota of 20, that's parallel. Right? Plus is a data parallel SIMD operation. Right? If I take. Um, so that's what you're lying. Yeah. Yeah. Is Everything is right. Everything is parallel. Um, yeah. So that's what makes it by construction because every single one of these operations is a parallel or parallelizable operation by default. Yes? Uh, besides sheer verbosity, what is like NumPy lacking in regards to an APL style or something? What is it lacking? Well, I mean, you could do that operation, for example. You could add 5 to the range 20, and that would be an easy operation that would parallelize it, synthesize it for you at least. But uh, what, uh, there's a lot more concepts, it seems like, in APL. I don't know what's lacking. I'm trying to give you a good answer here. Uh, there's, it's, it's easy to just say everything, but <laughs> uh, that's not really helpful. Um, let's go technical to social. It's missing, it's missing core semantics, uh, vocabulary, um, maturity of the code base, uh, flexibility of the nota uh, 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 compilability of the notation. Um, uh, programmer interface context, uh, programmer developer tooling surrounding it. Um, culture, uh, it's missing, it, the culture is a huge problem. Um, it's missing a degree of design consistency that's critical in my opinion. It's, um, what it, the problem is it's essentially a, bolt on, a, a bolted add-on feature to a language that was never meant to allow you to work in this way. And that leads to all sorts of problems. Um, people have tried to do like parallel compilation of Python type stuff. And the problem is, is that you very, in order to do it well, so this is the, this is the kind of, there's a, there's a fixed point that people always begin to arrive at. And so when people start trying to do parallel programming with data SIMD type stuff in their language, the better it gets, the more usable it gets, and the more they are able to enjoy working with it, the closer it resembles APL. Mm -hmm. And this is true across every single design pattern across the board. Every language that tries to do this, the more mature they get, the better uh, the interfaces get, and the more the design gets, the closer it resembles APL. And the closer people working with it begin to write code like APL. So, so yeah, NumPy is a thing that I'm most familiar with that resembles yeah. Yeah. a lot of the operators are similar to operators. Yeah, so the problem is they're, a lot of them are baby operators, yeah. right? Like plus is the baby stuff. Sure. You've got to have good key. You've got to have good group spy. You've got to have good um, interval index and, and all these other things to, to be, it's the, the choice of vocabulary combined with how we can put it together in its notation and its syntax and then the surrounding context. So for example, you can't use a Python debugger to debug NumPy stuff very well. In fact, Python's debuggers are pretty bad in general. Um, I haven't shown you this, but for instance, I can go in here to my debugger, look at TT, and I can say, oh, well, I need to debug this, so I'm going to put a stop point there and run it. And I, and I can walk through the code. I have. I have a Visual Studio-esque or a, or a classic IDE-esque debugger that I can step through everything. I can go back. I can do live development and, and, and type on the REPL in every, any frame of execution that I want. I can set traps and, and, and do all of that. And I've got a vast 
ecosystem of additional tooling around me the, to access .NET, Java, R, you know, databases, the internet, uh, sockets, web servers, all of that fits within the exact same mold that I can then apply all of this with. So there's an ecosystem around it that they are fully integrated together, and that makes a difference as well. But in, it, it, from a pure language standpoint, NumPy is designed around what scientific computing people need to do their number crunching. And they're not interested in aesthetics, they're not interested in broad usability, and they're not interested in making a general purpose domain specific programming language that works. They're interested in solving a very specific problem. So it's a very different culture and a very different way in which the language evolves. Yes? Um, can you speak a bit about how you can step through programs that are written in this like data flow higher order yeah. style? Well, let's try it. Let's go, well, let's, do, let's do this one. So let's step through this function, right? So we're gonna stop here. I'm gonna set my stop point there. And then I'm going to run uh, PLTK and gets my AST through it. And it stopped here, right? So that's my stack. And now I can pull up, now I'm minimalist, so I don't, have and I disable all of the tools uh, that does this. But I can go in and I can say, let's trace this. Oh, oh, I, I did it again. Come on, dock it, dock it, dock. Dock, you bastard. There you go, okay. Get it, get it, get it. Ah, I hate trackpads. All right, here we go. So here we've got this, and you can't see it, but now we have our stepping, right? So I can start here and say, oh, what's the D of this function? Oh, uh, what's my I function in this case, right? Because that's actually extracted from here. And then I can step through it, and I say, okay, let's uh, skip the current line, progress down, trace into the expression. So I can start exp tracing into the expression and going in and seeing what we're doing. So if I go through that one, you know, stop on the next line of the calling function, et cetera. Uh, so I can continue the execution, and, and then it finishes, right? So I've got a full stepwise debugger that I can go through and use, um, and, and debug inside of that expression, change things live on the fly. Uh, I can, I can uh, save my workspace uh, and, and work back from it, et cetera, and interact with all of this stuff. And then when I'm done, I can apply the compiler to it and make it go on the GPU. But has anybody uh, tried to get the code to run yet? This is a workshop. <laughs> Got to type in some APL characters, people. Don't be afraid. So on try APL, there's a, visual, uh, a graphic keyboard that you can use to point and click at the symbols. How do you type APL characters? That's not how you do it. Uh, I go to. Uh, Is that it? Yes. There you go. So the control key on Windows or the uh, um, back quote key on, on Macs allows you to have an extra shift key, basically, that will let you type in the other characters. And I'm a touch typist by, I don't know why. I've been touch typing for a very long time, so I strongly believe in touch typing. Um, so I made anybody who came to the original LambdaConf workshop uh, t type all of their characters in without, you know, cheating and pushing the buttons. But because we're limited on time here, uh, you can use the buttons. And you know, if you're in, if you're in, um, in here, I disable it, but you can always view the language bar, um, and it'll be a little small here. Uh, but the language bar has all of the symbols on it. You can just go up and click on what you want, for instance. And hovering over that, that language bar, for instance, will give you um, mini documentation for what you want to do and allow you to go to the full, full documentation for the function if you want. I'm sorry? 
sorry, I'm missing the first word. Before that? Before. Oh, what if you're just using GNU IPL? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> basically. Is it that bad? I heard it was catching up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, learn both and see. <laughs> That's the po political answer. <laughs> How do I map the hyper or super key to API? Ah, you're on Linux, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh land holds. What is it called? It's called variant. There you go. That'll set your left alt to uh, 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 the alt GR style, a mode switch, your mode switch key, which will then be your shift key to switch around. But if you're, are you typing on a, like a international Euro European keyboard or something like that? Oh, if, if it's just US, then this works great. Or something like this. It's been a while. I'm, call, I'm doing that from memory, so it's kind of fuzzy. Um, and you can use switch if you want the right alt instead of the left alt, or you can make it the Windows key or meta key or other stuff like that. But this will set your alt, left alt key to a mode switch, and that's usually the nearest to your thumb. So then I just shift my thumb over, so it hit a, instead of hitting space, I just shift over, and then I can continue typing. So do you normally have multi-line APL statements, or are they generally always one line? There is no line. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of true. true. You don't think about it in the same way, right? Uh, the, the equivalent of a line in APL is often the character. So we think by characters, not by lines. The lines, so I think of every line in my compiler as a compiler pass, not as a line in of itself. Okay. So like, uh, for instance, this piece of code here, which I'm still working on. Uh, yeah, let's do, yeah, all the way down to here. This is um, my sketch. It doesn't work yet, but it's my sketch of a static single assignment computation with closure creation and a number of other things. It does inlining of operator functions and uh, inlining of variables, simplification of the tree, resolving local variables, and all sorts of other things. And when I see this, I don't see, oh, this is a line of code of this, this, and this, right? I see a couple of utility functions, then I see you know, this line here, which is doing the initial local name resolution. So that's one compiler pass. Then this name is, is chasing variables uh, to clear up variables or to clear up operators. And this one is beginning the operator inlining process on a fixed point. So each of these lines to me is a compiler pass, not a f APL function, I mean, conceptually. I mean, maybe this is just because it's your personal thing, but don't you normally, do people normally document that? I mean, what is documentation coming up for here? <laughs> Uh, watch one of my other talks, uh, my, my other design patterns in APL talk on, at Dialog 17, I think. Uh, but, <sighs> oh, we're going philosophy. Okay. Sorry, it's kind of a tangent. But it's no, no. I, it's one of the problems that makes pe scare people scared of writing code like this, which is fair, right? Uh, not everybody in Dialog uh, writes code like this. In fact, Morton, when he's with me, he always pipes up and says, just as a disclaimer, not everybody in our community writes code this way. <laughs> um, but the, I think I actually have some samples of how other people write code. Um, so I remember some of it from last year. I mean, it's like, like you always have like this 10,000 foot view or this high level foot view. And yeah. I mean, do you at least, is that what's common in the APL? Yes, yes. And remember, that's one of the design patterns, right? Macro versus micro. This is, this is a, but we can pull up, can I pull it up? Can I pull it up? Uh, let's pull up. So here's the most verbose, I don't recommend this at all to anybody, style of writing APL code. Do not be tempted. Stay far away. Don't do ifs, people. Kids just say no. 
okay? However, there is a style of APL that does this kind of stuff. And it's done for a very, very specific reason, and it works in that context, and if you were in that context, do it that way, otherwise do not. If you're gonna you know, follow my philosophy of how this is done, right? Um, there, the names are serving as documentation. However, another thing that people do is something like this. This is what I call the, um, the parallel, the, 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 the two-column style. And in this, we have our code on one side and our explanation on the other side. So it's like a Cliff Notes type thing. Uh, the problem here is it's difficult to change quickly and rapidly adapt, um, yeah. right? Yeah. But for a single one-off utility function that is mostly going to be read and not, it's mostly pedagogical, not meant to be used on a daily basis, it can be very helpful. But I really, really, really believe that um, my, my experiences have shown that, that documentation is so overblown. I agree, but I mean... But no, no, I mean, I mean people, people pay lip service, but they still say, oh, I want documentation. You know, it's, it's not just that, it's that I've tried to document this multiple times, and every single time it got so in the way, it ru it, you know, it, it really, really, really does get in the way, because it ruins my ability to see more of the code and see patterns. Right, but for example, I would be curious as to what you are attempting to do with that piece of code, because maybe, for example, some other programmer was attempting something but didn't achieve it. So yeah. how is some guy coming in afterwards, how does he know that he actually did what he said he was going, or what he thought he was going to do? Um, you can use uh, black box testing, that's one way. And the other way is study and understand your code and what it's actually doing and know the problem domain. Um, people love to be able to write code that they don't understand. And I am adamantly against that practice because I think it incurs so much additional technical debt. It's like using a credit card to buy stuff. It's so much technical debt, it's not worth it at all, even in the medium term, I would say. It seems to work in the short term, but if you design your patterns the way you work around a style of coding that lets you understand the problem faster, then you can write your code fast enough that the short term doesn't get unduly hampered, and in the long run, you just are so far ahead, I think it's, it's vastly more important to do that. Um, Maybe you should come in the code when it's stable. It's oh. never stable. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, this, this code obviously has a purpose, right? Yeah. Display tree, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's like three words. Yeah, that's three words too many. <laughs> no, no. For, I mean, no. I, I mean this really. It's because I can say more about my intent with the code than those three words. So your, your dissertation is all API. I wish they won't let me do that. I would love to write it like a book of poetry, where I just put name the poem and then some code and let people simmer in it. But <laughs> they're not going to let me do that. It, it, it's kind of hard to skim, right? So it's, like it's not. Yes, intentionally so. You should never ha be able to skim it. I design it intentionally for that reason. I do not want comments, skimming code. There's code comments to explain the what, and that seems like your philosophy is very much against that for a good reason, but there's, there's also the why, right? There's, there's and I'm mostly against the why, too. Okay. Yeah. I've just found over time that the why doesn't help me. Yeah, but it, well, it, it doesn't work. So it doesn't no, you, no, it doesn't I've, I've tried it with other people, and other people, the, the why gets in the way of them understanding the problem because they use it as a crutch. They think they understand what is intended by the why rather than seeing the code and seeing what it really is doing and what the intent is really being expressed. And every, so what happens is if somebody comes along and says, this doesn't make sense, I want them to explain why it doesn't make sense and explain why it's clear this isn't working and then we rewrite the code so it better explains that. And it, you know, so if I have documentation, I'm very, very tempted to leave it because the documentation is you know, combined is clear enough. I understand that to a degree, but yeah. if I have to maintain a professional code base, yeah. there's not always the time, unfortunately, to do that. There's always time to do it over. Um, if, you, if you systematically begin to think about your code at a macro view and focus on whole program rewrite, optimizing for whole program rewrite, you will eventually get there. However, 
I do not think that I can recommend this style to everybody's favorite programming language. There are reasons those other best practices exist in those other languages. I can get away with this because I am leveraging a lot of other stuff that compensates for those best practices. If I just got rid of those best practices and didn't have anything to replace them with, then no, it wouldn't work. It would be a horrible nightmare. And I agree with you there. But, but I think that see, trying to replace those with other methodologies, I think, is a, is a an important exercise, and B, uh, opens up new avenues of, of, of programming that allow us to move forward more effectively. Um, for instance, I could not have done this in a traditional style with traditional best practices in the compiler. I tried. It didn't work. Um, I couldn't think about the code. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't read it. I couldn't reason about it. I was totally lost. And I wasn't even doing half of what I was doing in here. But I can pick this code up. I can leave it for a while, come back to it, go, hmm, ah, and it just works, right? And I can see much more clearly what's happening. And I can catch my bugs more easily. Uh, you know, not that I don't write buggy code, but uh, it's easier for me to reason about the code because I'm, I'm always trying to rewrite it. And I'm always convinced that I can do it better. And with documentation, I have a tendency not to do that. But uh, to give an example of why three words are bad, you have in Java, get primes or prime numbers between, right? It's an okay, num uh, okay name. And then you have our, you know, our uh, our function. Now, which is more descriptive? I mean, obviously, the function is more the, the AKL can be more descriptive, right? Yeah. But for say, say for example, I have a production code base. Yeah. And something blows up, and it's an APL. Yeah. Great, and it's perfectly explanatory. But my APL code base is some 10,000 lines, and I am new to the code base. And yeah. I have to quickly find the relative area yeah. of what I need to fix. Yep. I mean, I don't program in APLs. I mean, yep. it's, you're kind of missing a piece of this. Yeah. But how easy would it be for that new programmer to basically figure out? I mean, yes, at some point I need to understand the breadth. I mean, if I am new to the code base, it's going yeah. take me a while to get up there. Yep. So, I mean, yep. what is the standard way of basically quickly identifying a snippet of code that I need to start working from? Master apprentice relationships inside of the companies with small teams. And code that's architected to allow you to see the picture clearly. To varying degrees, right? This is not like there's an ideal and then there's reality. But yeah. you know, you know, APLers do use comments, mostly out of desperation, but they do sometimes use them. Um, I'm I'm expressing where you can get to, not necessarily where everybody will be at when they write their code. But most of the time, APLers understand their code bases really, really well, and they don't write 10,000 line code bases if they can write it in a thousand lines instead. Um, and when a newbie comes in. They spend time, they're expected to spend time really learning how this stuff works. And they're given small tasks with the appropriate guidance to explore that. And you just don't have, you don't, I've never met a professional APL programmer in any of the dialogue user meetings who didn't really understand what was going on in their code base. Even the newbies of newbies, when they are brought in, they're ex held to an expert level standard by being brought in and taught this stuff. And it takes them a while to do that, but APLers are patient. They would rather have you understand the code base and make good changes rather than begin to make commits immediately and have everything break. And part of the reason is a conservatism on their part, because almost all professional APL deployments are mission critical. Um, and mission critical applications that get updated you know, two, three, four, five more times a day cannot have willy-nilly commits done to them. It's just impossible to, uh, especially when millions of dollars are on the line or billions of dollars are on the line where you make a mistake and things go horribly wrong. That's why they don't have change processes. In, at most, the, I'm generalizing here, there's always exceptions and big, big giant exceptions. But a lot of these companies don't have change processes. They don't have a cycle of user stories or sprints or anything like that. They have. The customer comes in and says, this is broken. They say, OK, show me. They say, look here, it doesn't work. And they say, does this look right? They say, yeah, that looks right. And they both read the code. 
They both agree that it meets the spec because the spec is the code. They all say, we're good. And then it goes into auto QA and goes through their very rigorous QA process and leaves. And you don't have any cycle where ambiguity can be introduced anywhere. And so if you're a newbie programmer, you are a source of ambiguity. And you're not, you, you need to get on, get on board with, with how it works. Because if you make that commit and you, you're literally betting you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars that that commit's going to work. And that's not, you know, that, it's not acceptable to do that if you don't understand the so code then, base. Yeah, the professional culture in the APA world then is you need a more solid understanding of the code base. Before yeah. You start actually yeah, it. yeah. Now, you can write APL code that's designed to not have that. It won't be as productive, but it might allow you to get in a little easier. Um, but I still think you should always be trying to go for that whole program rewrite optimization. Um, you can do it incrementally, right? You can pr proceed slowly. I evolved this over time, right? Initially, I was using Scheme and Java and lots of abstraction, lots of hierarchies and lots of libraries and everything was pulling in. And over time, everything just had to go. Nothing, none of that was helpful. And I had to continue to remove, 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 and delete. I think it... Uh, overall, including things like libraries that I added and deleted, the code base for that hundred lines of code or a thousand lines of code, I think it's something like 4,000 commits and like 5 million lines of code changes or something like that. Uh, <laughs> and, and part of that is just, I need a library. This isn't going to work at all. That code has to leave, this, the tree, that kind of stuff. But that, that was weight in the tree. That was weight as that I, I was relying on mentally as a mental space to think about the problem. And that had to go. And so lots and lots of stuff has been removed. And it's been come, it, it's a lot easier to work with. But yeah. You, you, are, you are working directly with a machine. You're not working with a thing that generates a machine. Right. I am, I am high level work, I am high level hacking the machine, yes. I'm, I, I am directly connected to the performance model, to the, uh, the data model, to everything. I, I am, I'm plugged into the matrix. I'm reading the code directly. You know. In Lisp, you never write a right. program. You write a program that writes a program. Even more than that, in, in Scheme, you never write a program. You never write a program that writes a program. You write a language that you use to write a program that writes a program. Yes. And this is how you do things, right? Yeah. And that makes Scheme unreadable, even though it's perfectly elegant and nice aesthetically when you look at it. It's unreadable because you don't know which language you're in. Uh, Haskell has a smaller version of that with their giant import list at the beginning of enable feature X. Or, or what they've got a line now that's like all the things or something, right? Um, but, but Scheme was hard because everybody had a different language. Everyone was speaking a different language. This is the, the polar opposite. You know, everybody is speaking the exact same language. So, AP, I mean, I've done a little bit of research on APL. I mean, they say APL is interpreted, but is it, so they don't compile down to a binary format? It's actually interpreted on the fly? APL, APL has, until recently, compilers have not been able to keep up with interpreters in, on APL. Really? Yeah. So what does it, I mean, it interprets it into basically, it, it just JIT? It's just doesn't even JIT. Almost all APL interpreters aren't even JITting. Uh, very, very, very recently, like in the past three or four years, Dialog has added a bytecode interpreter into the system. Okay, so it basically just executes CPU instructions directly? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, and, and they recognized that they were not going to be able to keep this up in the face of modern uh, hyperscaling computing. So that's why I'm there. I deliver a compiler that solves the big data problem, the scaling problem, the GPU code, all that stuff. Okay, so you do, you compile down to CUDA basically. I compile down to C++ that I then have my runtime that I manage for different platforms. So it runs on C, uh, or, sorry, um, on Intel CPUs, OpenCL through AMD or that stuff, or on NVIDIA through CUDA, that oh, kind of stuff. So you basically transpile from APL to one of those. And yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm using some helper libraries and some, some, some library functions that are other people have written because I don't care how to write the fastest prefix sum known to man. I'm using somebody else to do that. But, yeah. And are you finding, I don't know if you put a paper out, I'm assuming you put out multiple papers. <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard and how unappealing this stuff is to the traditional well, academic community. <laughs> um, However, yes, I have published a few papers, yeah. 
is the stuff. performance gains you find? I'm guessing it's context or domain. On research. on average, it's somewhere between um, two to five times on the low end and four or five. Uh, no, it was twenty thousand percent, two hundred, two thousand, a thousand times, or something like that. So, compared to executing directly on this. Uh, compared to the dialogue um, system interpreter, where there's no interpreter overhead, um, or where we're where it's minimal. Um, and that takes into account the amount of time it takes to move the data from memory into the GPU? For some of them, yeah. Depends. Um, so uh, when you're moving data on the GPU, it depends on the kind of data you're moving, uh, obviously. Like, um, if, I mean, if I was doing a database application where I've got lots and lots of data in there and I have to basically stream that data over a lot of large computations, is that a good application for this? Um, it can be, yeah. yeah. In fact, one of our target applications is uh, vector store databases. So super, 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 super high performance uh, time series data, for instance. Right. Yeah. So you basically, I'm guessing you preload, you basically start a computation. And you start what, what we will be doing, the compiler doesn't do this yet. You have to manually do it. But you would inject data on a separate stream that just keeps stuffing the GPU full of data and taking data out. And you have kernels that are just queued up and running constantly. So it takes, it'll take, you know, 300 milliseconds or something like that to we'll warm up. Yeah, but then as long as you keep pumping data through, you're just pummeling the system with as much data as you possibly can and trying to maximize your PCI X bus. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, and the, uh, the com I'm trying to keep the compiler simpler and not add too many features because I'm trying to make a coherent dissertation around it where just the basic compiler passes are covered. So, you know, constant folding, single static, static single assignment, uh, function inlining, register type allocation, all the basic stuff that everybody wants to know, lexical analysis, and then make show how you do that on the GPU with that, and then floodgates are open. I'm, I'm tackling all the fun stuff then are after that. So you're not feature complete then with what dialogue offers, I'm guessing? Um, I am very, very close to feature complete on the defunds language. Um, very close. Um, there's a few big, big ticket items that are missing, like nested arrays aren't supported yet, things like that. Um, but the primitives that you see are more or less there. They're not all highly performant optimized for all workloads yet. There's a lot of work still to do. Um, you know, it's a very new technology. So do you need dialogue then to use code EFS stuff? You do not strictly need it. However, the, the compiler is designed to run within the dialogue environment. Because we're not giving you debugging. We're not giving you any additional help anywhere. Uh, we don't give friendly error messages or anything. We're meant primarily as a plug-in into the dialogue system and ecosystem. So you basically use dialogue to test it all out and then once you yeah, yeah. go... You run on your interpreter and when you want to see how it performs, you just run, uh, basically you just co-defunds it. And you do that from inside your uh, system. So the, the idea would be like if you're in here, you would just run a, a user command like co-defunds on that namespace that you just created, and it would build you your new, new name, compile that namespace, and then you could test it out. It's like a separate optimization passage. Yeah, just like a optimize this for me. Yeah, and then it works inside of that, this REPL session, just like any other namespace that you're using. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And, now, and then if you need to, you can then plug into that from C API. So you don't have to plug in through the interpreter. You can go direct to Metal and, and uh, uh, take a DLL that's compiled from CodeDefunds and link directly in from whatever other ecosystem you're using. Oh, cool. So you can basically compile a DIL into it was APL into your... Yeah, so you can produce... Optimize and then call it in from C++ or Hacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, what's called the C API, which allows you to call your APL compiled functions from another language and pipe data into Is the system. Is there an overhead to that? Uh, yes. Uh, the overhead would be you have to manage the pointers to the data somehow and make sure that the data coming in is allocated, deallocated, and everything like okay. that. Okay, I mean, you basically pass a pointer through. You don't yeah. have to basically copy data. Uh, as long as the data is in the correct structure, you don't have to copy the data. All right, so it's basically zero copy. Yeah, provided that you do it right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the default is to copy it because it's the most reliable. But if you want to... If you want to use the C API and like really for example, tweak it. If I was going to a data store, I could load that with C and then pass it over to an APL computation library. Provide it was in the right structure, yeah, you'd be good. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Unrelated question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, sort of, if you could describe your, your mental representation of these sorts of expressions, how you reason about it, and whether the sure. fact that you type it back to front, essentially, uh, affects how you how you think about these things. 
Like, uh, you know, given the, the, the prime number example, uh, algorithm, for example, when you're recalling it, do you play it sort of backwards with a, a mental test example to visualize sort of what the intermediate so, arrays are? Or is it so I think extremely ex abstractly. My professors hate me because I hate examples. Uh, it's very hard for me to use examples. Um, and you may have noticed I struggle with that. <laughs> uh, but the way I read something like, so like that, that third line, I get the way, the way I would read that. The technical functions are I is assigned to the um, where of P e equals the iota of S gets the tally of P, right? Now, I don't think of it like that when I see that. When I see that, I think of I is the set of nodes that are root nodes. And, and S is me, remember, remember the size of the tree right now. Or remember my, because I'm about to allocate new nodes. I'm about to add new nodes to the tree, and they're going to start at S. So S is my starting point for new nodes in the tree. Um, and then when I read this L line here, which is slightly more complicated, I'm saying L, I want to add new nodes to L. And those nodes are going to be the, uh, the, the left nodes for those new nodes are going to be the nodes uh, which are the node IDs where they're not a root node and their parents are root nodes and the, um, they are the last node among their siblings in the AST. And so that's how I see that. Because that, that um, L uh, right tack member left tack uh, filter reduction not equals is my pattern for uh, rightmost nodes in the at a given level. And then it goes on from there, right? So I say like, okay, so these new nodes, their parents are going to be I, um, their type kind and their names are going to be two zero or two zero zeros, uh, and then. I'm going to start out working on some other nodes, so I'm going to have a J. So this set of nodes is going to be nodes that are of type 1, so they're going to be bindings, and I want only bindings to functions, and I want only bindings that appear at the top level of the function, and so on down the, right, down the line. What is the rationale for using numbers for types and kinds instead of, like, I don't know, a character or something? Because I can compute on them which is a vast violation of all programming discipline that's been applied to all of your high-level languages. Because I have no compunction, no reservation, no hesitation of adding, multiplying, dividing, applying logarithm, shifting, or doing anything to my pointers. I do all of it to my pointers. And so the numbers are critical to that. In fact, symbols, for instance. When I say symbols, I don't actually mean symbols. I use symbols the way I do symbols, which means that symbols here, for instance, are the names of the symbols. But if you look at the end tree, which contains symbols, this I call a, a, a symbol pointer mixed vector, right? So exactly. Negative means it's a symbol pointing and referring to some thing. So this is a, a raw identity, so this is like a symbol pointer. If it's positive, then it's a pointer pointer pointing to some node in the AST. And so when I do st static single assignment, for instance, I don't resolve every single value into a pointer because Dialog's defunds language is not that simple. It looks trivially simple, but... Oh. <laughs> I just have to do this to you guys. I'm sorry. You've got a. You're you're gonna get it. <laughs> Et voila. I'll have EMT standing by. So, here's an example. Where do the Y's refer to? Where do the X's refer to? In all of these things. So in the first example, x gets to, refers to 5. Simple, easy, right? Second example, x refers to 5, easy. Then we get a new x refers to x6, right? Seems easy, except what have we just done? Something, something should be triggering in your functional programming mind. Something should be... We shadowed x. Yes, we shadowed x, but what did we not do? We defined y. No. Well, we didn't do that, but that's not relevant to this particular thing. 
We did not introduce a syntactic construct to establish a new lexical contour. So what does that mean? Which means that x gets is both a binding construct and a mutation construct. It's set bang and let at the same time. So that means as we go down further, I've got this little function, x resolves this, this f resolves that x at the appropriate time, right? And that x resolves to that. OK, that seems OK. Now I've got a nested function where x is lexically referred to back. And this x refers to the 5 and this x. Uh, but the g, that x, doesn't refer to that. That refers to that. <laughs> Statement separator. OK. Uh, so, so does it get rebound, or does it get uh, shadowed? It gets shadowed. shadowed. It's dynamic binding. It's dynamically scoped. It's not dynamically scoped. No? No. It's dynamically bound. The, it's lexically scoped, but dynamically bound. Wait, so like. That's what this, one, that's what this one shows. That's what this one shows. Right. Sorry? So am I reading this from left to right? Each expression, right? Is, is, each expression executes from right to left. But the statements occur oh, left okay. to right. Yeah. So but when x equals 4, is that actually getting used? Or you just Yeah, because uh, g is calling f, which refers to x. But that f gets resolved at this time, which means it refers to oh, x. It, yeah. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's good stuff, right? <laughs> the right term. <laughs> so, so that means that the semantics of this language, despite appearing very, very simple, is, is not trivial at all. And so that means, for instance, in my static single assignment pass, when I'm doing this, I can't statically say, oh, this x refers to one thing. That x refers to an arbitrary number of things. And so rather than doing this by using phi nodes, which I could, phi nodes, inside the, the, the piece, I create closures dynamically, sort of like uh, creating functors in C++ at the call time, not at the resolution time. So to manage free variables, I actually leave free variables in their unresolved state as symbols. And then only local variables get resolved to pointers, to actual values. And then I feed data through using these closure creations at call sites. So how does it resolve which uh, oh, oh, where am I? Here I am. There I am. OK, so we have two references to x here and here. Yeah. So when we get here, x is bound. Save this up. This x needs to resolve now, because we just applied, a, applied an operation. Yes. All right, so now we get here. This x, x now has this value. We go here. g is now run, which means it's going to run f, which means f now has to call and resolve its values. So it's going to resolve it at this point, not at that point. So free variables are resolved at call time, not at definition time. So what, what value does g end up as? Does it use both the, the 5x and the 4x? Yes. Okay. So you use, oh, you use both. Yes. Yeah. Well, the left that's argument x that's sent to f that's is resolved that's here. That's 5. Oh, that's 5. That's 5. Yeah. This x is 4. Right, because you're thinking like uh, the standard, you're thinking of these as statically scoped lexical variables. These are dynamically bound, not statically bound. <laughs> yeah, so to handle this in the compiler, that's why that compiler pass I showed you to resolve static, that's why I'm doing so much in there. That's why it's like nine lines long instead of, you know, two. Is there I'm assuming there's some advantage to doing it this way. Um, you mean in the compiler or in the language? the language? It keeps the language extremely simple. It removes syntactic overhead. And it allows you to have mutation of your variable space. So you can have like parameters and things like that, dynamically bound things, without needing separate constructs to do it. Okay. Um, so you can, you can like mutate. You can have an accumulator variable at a top level, do stuff with it in the lower levels and manage it without having a new notation for it. As long as you don't rebind it. As long as you don't rebind it. Yeah, the, I mean. so yeah. Yes? Just to, to confirm, in that statement, G is a, a curried version of F. 
No. G, that's the composition function. So we, we say that x is bound with f. So it's a new function that, when called, will call f with its right function and pass x as the left argument to f. Yeah. Uh, you can think of it as curry, but I, I think curry is a little iffy right, with that. That's, but yeah. that's why the x gets evaluated there, even right. though the entire Yeah, because is it is an application of an operator. Okay. So it's a call time thing. But call time for the composition. Not call time for f. Right. Yes. So then, of course, there's interesting stuff you have to do in the compiler to achieve these things. Um, but we can handle even this kind of stuff using the same techniques that we were talking about today. Are these um, these notes online somewhere, or is this? Like yeah, this is part of the dissertation, so that's on the lean pub stuff. Um, so the first X was Fox, right? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I get that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically lazy evaluation. Yeah. And so that's why I use this representation that I do that allows me that flexibility to have both free variables and resolve variables at the same time in the same structure. So I have symbols and pointers in the same structure. Omega and other omega. Omega and other omega. Well, you've got the omega omega symbol there. Oh. Right. Yeah, because I, I, I statically ensure that the references from 0 to neg 4 are claimed already. They always refer to these things. And everything after that is user-defined symbols well, or, or primitives. Alpha alpha, mean? alpha alpha is what we call the left operand to an operator. So if you've got a higher order function, the left argument to that higher order function is alpha alpha. Well, there was no alpha alpha in that. Right. But remember, 5 is positionally referring to something in here. And I want neg 4 to always be omega omega. And I want neg 3 to always be alpha alpha. So in no code, in no AST, will I ever have a symbol pointing to neg 4 that's not omega omega. So here, neg 5 is pointing to average. Yeah. Neg 6 is pointing to the, the, to the first axis reduction. Yeah. And then 2 is a pointer to an. Two is a pointer to a node in the AST. Oh. <clears throat> right. And so that's why I'm choosing this, this number space, because I, I can compute over it quickly. It, it's efficiently understood on the GPU. And I have explicit control of the kind of operations I'm doing with it. And that allows me to manipulate my AST more freely. And I'm not restricted to particular patterns that I have to establish a priori that may not fully suit the problem space. <laughs> Comments, questions, thoughts? We can do a wrap up. Yeah. Any? I have a general question about ACL. Yeah. So, what are some, some common problem domains where ACL is well suited? So, the way we say it is um, APL is a general purpose domain specific language for problems that can be easily expressed using arrays, which is everything. Heavily used in finance. So, so the, the places where you really see it used right now um, is big oil, big data, um, finance, uh, simulations, uh, logistics, um, planning, uh, actuarial insurance, uh, medical, uh, so like um, drug trials, uh, personal info databases type stuff, so like medical records, systems. Um, Accounts management, stuff like that. Um, uh, recently, a few people have been using it in physics research to do some interesting stuff. Uh, it's used in some biochem ac applications. Um, uh, believe it or not, it, you've probably interacted multiple times over this month with an APL system, <laughs> um, particularly if you, ran, if you ran a credit card or accessed online banking or something like that. or stocks. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Thoughts? I, I would like to propose Aaron Sue's ninth, which is any sufficiently complex data parallel software will contain a bug written, poorly specified, and incomplete version of APL. <laughs> <laughs> After Greenspawn and Lisp. Yeah. 
That would work. I, I have the perfect example because that's what I was doing two years ago. Oh, really? And Did uh, you find it happening? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, yes. I was doing data visualization. I'm not lying. <laughs> and I was doing lots of stuff with arrays, getting frustrated, saying, oh, I, I need kind of this, and I need kind of this, and yeah. I created a bunch of sort of operators, yeah. and then I did your APL workshop, and I was like, oh, so that's what that looks like. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad that uh, you were able to get something out of it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? I, I'm going to be around to chat and assist with anybody who wants to continue playing with stuff, or I, I don't know if there's something called unconference here. There is. Is that? I'm, like, for instance, the drawing functions, how you make those trees, is a pretty fun exploration of how you can do certain things in APL. I, I'm happy to explore how we do tree drawing to visualize data in certain ways, some techniques. Um, I'm happy to just talk about whatever you want. Or oh, you want me to live code some stuff? We can do whatever. You know, we want to explore your problems. So like converting the encodings type stuff, or? Yeah, you did the, the fed a tree into uh, one of the depth trees and then rotated it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, we can, we can do some of that. Yeah. Some, some use for that. OK, yeah, sure. Um, I will have to find, I don't know where I should hang out, but I think it's lunchtime now, right? It is yeah. lunchtime. All right, then we'll get some lunch. Um, yeah. So, how was it? You guys okay with it? Awesome. I'm, it's a it's a different different style than what I'm usually used to, but yeah. <laughs>